I'd like you to think about a project that you work on. Maybe it has a lot of complexity to it, or perhaps it's something that's much more manageable. But no matter where your project fits in this spectrum, I'm certain that at least some of the complexity comes from concurrency. And note, lowercase c, I'm just talking about multi-threading, managing asynchronous operations. These are things that you find in pretty much every project, and yet it's also one of the most notoriously difficult things to do in programming. So why do we do it? Well, it's true our CPUs have a lot of cores in them nowadays, but more likely it's because of network requests, API calls. Our systems, they just spend a lot of time waiting, and it sure would be nice if while they're doing that, we could keep them responsive. Swift's concurrency system, uppercase C, uh, its goal is to try to make managing asynchronous operations easier while also shifting some of those notoriously difficult problems, data races, right, from, from runtime issues to compile time issues. And it's trying to do all that while also maintaining compatibility with the existing body of Swift source. And I think that at this point, we can agree that this has been a non-trivial task. The, uh, the goal, the whole idea here was modeling the concurrent behavior of a program using the type system. One little sentence. But this really represents this fundamental departure from how we have thought about and structured concurrency in our programs in the past. And if you start adopting these things in your programs, well, you might find that it helps you manage some of that complexity. But you might also feel like it's done nothing but add more. And if you fall into that last category, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you've been frantically looking for something to just help you find the best way to make those problems go away. And unfortunately, that's tricky because a lot of these problems are very situational, and picking the best solution involves really understanding why they're showing up in the first place. And what, is, what does best solution even mean? This is these profound changes, and we're all just really starting to figure it out. We've been experimenting, and not all those experiments have worked out very well. But as we've been experimenting and learning, we've been using a common set of concepts, a common set of primitives. And all very much so, we've been doing this together. And I think that that's really nice. However, I also know for a fact that doing this can be incredibly frustrating. Um, I got my start with concurrency, something like Swift 5.8, but even the last release um, of 5, 5.10, uh, I'm not going to use the word impossible, but I'm going to say it was very challenging to make a program with complete checking turned on that also had no warnings. You had to understand a lot, not just about the system, but also about how the compiler specific implementation of the system worked. And uh, things got way easier with 6.0. The compiler got so much more sophisticated, but it also brought with it these new tools to help us better express how the concurrency was working in our applications. 6.1, it was just a very good refinement on that release. But 6.2, which we've had for a few months now, this is more than just a refinement. I think this is a very significant release. And the reason for that really comes from this thing called a vision document. It's a, it's a part of the evolution process. And the, what it is is it's this, this high-level document that just describes a direction, a goal, maybe that's going to take many individual changes to get to potentially over a long period of time. And the one that I'm thinking of was called Improving the Approachability of Data Race Safety. And this vision document included seven concrete changes. Uh, um, and it did not take a long time to implement because we got all but one in Swift 6.2. I want to zoom in for a second on this word, approachability. It makes it sound like you're just getting started using concurrency maybe for the first time. And I do think the changes here help if that's where you're at. But I also think that these changes are very useful even for advanced users. They're, they're big, these are big changes. And when you have a complex language and you make big changes to a complex subsystem, I'm sure there's bound to be some surprises. And so I've been trying hard to pay attention to things people have been having trouble with, I even asked, tell me, have you had any, run into any problems with 
approachable concurrency, the changes that were proposed. Uh, and so far, not exclusively, but almost all the problems that I have seen have been related to controlling default isolation, right? Starting from non-isolated, which has been the default since concurrency was introduced into the language, and changing that so that you can now make the default main actor. I would imagine not that many people in this room are doing this, but it is happening. Uh, and you might think, okay, well, the reason that this is a problem is because now you're shifting all this work onto the main thread, so of course things are going to be slow. Uh, and that's true, that is technically possible, but so far, I have not seen anybody actually complain about that in practice. The problems that I have seen are related to other, other things. The, uh, the goal, the idea here with this feature was kind of based on the observation that many Swift programs are single-threaded, and not just these one-off little scripts you might write, but even big, full-featured applications. They do most, maybe even all, of their state management on the main thread. And so why not kind of push off exposing concurrency to them until they actually want to introduce it into their program. And when I saw this, this proposal, I thought, okay, really what this is about is just deciding which of these annotations would you like to write less. There are some programs, they have at main actor all over the place, uh, and there are others, libraries especially, where maybe there isn't a single main actor anywhere. Um, now, this is still early days, right? This feature has only really been available for people to try for a few months. I'm still learning about it, and so is the community. But I think I understand one of the reasons why some people are running into problems. Um, all Swift programs, single-threaded programs included, they make extensive use of libraries. And libraries make extensive use of concurrency. So the idea was you want to not be exposed to concurrency until you're actively using it, but people use APIs all the time, and those expose them to concurrency. And so what ends up happening is you still end up with problems, but these are problems that now the community as a whole does not have a lot of time understanding, and not have a lot of experience coming up with good solutions. Uh, one of the areas where people have been hitting problems is related to protocols. You know, these things, they, um, they get used in Swift sometimes. Let me show you one. It's called Custom String Convertible. This is in the, uh, the standard library. And remember, the reason why we even have this control over default isolation is because there has to be something. There's no such thing as undefined isolation. And in the standard library here, the default that applies is non-isolated. But what this really means is this description property, it has to be synchronously accessible in any context at any time. And when you think about it from that perspective, it's actually a really high bar. And this can be, this can be a problem. Let me show you how. So here's our conference type that conforms to this protocol. And so far we have no problems, but if we isolate that type, say to the main actor, well now this code no longer compiles. And the reason is, custom string convertible, it wants that description property to be non-isolated. And we do have a description property, but it's only synchronously accessible from the main thread. This, we're so close that there's this conflict and it's a very common problem. It's known as a protocol conformance isolation mismatch. There are many workarounds to this issue, but there's a new one that was shipped with Swift 6.2. It's called a global actor isolated conformance. Let me show you how this works. So same situation, but now what you can do is you can tell the compiler, well, actually, I conform to a special version of that protocol, one that is only valid that ma when it matches my isolation. And remember, we can set the default to main actor, so it's possible to actually do this implicitly without even realizing it, which I like because it's hiding that detail. But it can expose you to some problems that you might weren't anticipating. Here's one. So here's an example of this, an instance of this conference type, and I'm checking to see whether it actually is custom string convertible via a cast. And this is this new, this new phenomenon in 6.2, which is that this cast now is dependent on whether you're checking on the main actor or in a different isolation context. And so I took this code and I wanted to make sure that it worked before I presented it to all of you. And I, no matter what I did, I could not make this cast fail. Uh, and the reason is because that this, this cast here, well, that's a runtime thing. That's a 6.2 runtime thing. 
but I was using an older OS, and my cast was always succeeding. And so it was kind of poetic, because while I was trying to make a slide to present some of the problems that you can run into, I found a new problem. Uh, it is, it's fascinating though, isn't it, I think, that the type kind of changes depending on how, when and where, the con runtime context of its access. It's like the type of the type, which is called a, a, a metatype. And there's actually a new protocol now called sendable metatype that can define um, basically um, systems that cannot, cannot deal with these isolated conformances. Uh, and the thing is that this change, it has implications for libraries. It has implications for generic code. So even if you are thinking, I have no intention of ever setting my default to main actor, it may still impact clients of your libraries. In fact, it may implement, it may um, affect your code if you are interested in turning on main actor because you definitely use libraries in your own code. I want to talk about another feature of 6.2. Uh, let me show you this as a, here's a type. It's got one method. Uh, and that method, let's say the default is non-isolated, still so far very easy to use. But if we change that to be asynchronous, well now we have potential problems. Non-isolated asynchronous functions have this interesting and complicated history over the lifetime of Swift, but up until really recently, non-isolated plus async was defined to always run in the background. Unconditionally, it doesn't matter what the caller was doing. So suppose you have one of these conference types and you've made an instance, let's say on the main actor, and now you want to invoke attend. So you start on main, and I'm going to put a little, a little visual aid here to make sure that you remember this is a method, so self there. The instance that we're invoking this on has to become self. It has to start on the main actor and it has to move to the background. It has to leave one actor and move to the background, but only sendable types can do that. This is a class. This is a non sendable type. So here we have this very reasonable, in my opinion, looking implementation that turns out to be extremely hard to use. And this is very disappointing because not only are non-sendable types easy to write and very natural, they also are very useful in many situations. Now, uh, hard to use does not mean impossible, and it might not be easy to tell, but I actually had to, made the, I had to make the um, font for this slide smaller. And the reason I had to do that is because I'm going to add a lot of syntax. There is a way to get around this problem, and it involves using a feature called an isolated parameter. Here it is. A lot of people find this feature intimidating. But even if you don't find it intimidating, it's still a lot of code. Uh, and in Swift 6.2, there's a new way to express this idea. We can call this a non-isolated non-sending function. It's like a variant of a non-isolated asynchronous function. But the reason why I put so many slides getting here with so many animations that were difficult to produce was because I wanted you to feel good about why the word non-sending was chosen. This is a function that will not send transfer self from the caller and all the arguments into the background. It will remain on the caller's actor. This is a feature that eventually will become the way the language works. Soon this will be just the way, and you can opt into this behavior today with a, with a setting. Uh, however, if you look at this now, this code, you actually don't know how it behaves unless you know what that setting is. It's ambiguous, and there are ways you can use non-isolated non-sending explicitly to make that unambiguous. Um, but you've lo if, you, if you turn that on, you've lost the ability to make a function that runs in the background. How do you do that? Well, you can now express that too by using this at concurrent attribute. And when I first saw this, I thought, ah, another, another attribute, I'm not so sure. But I have come to really appreciate this because you're doing something that maybe requires a little more intention. And so it's nice that it's so explicit. All these changes came from SE0461. And I think this is just fantastic. However, uh, it changes the meaning of non-isolated asynchronous functions, potentially in a very significant way. And so it requires a migration. I am pleased, though, to tell you that the compiler supports this automated migration. It'll go through, and every time it finds one, it'll ask you what you mean and give you the option to be more specific. I've only done that for small projects so far, but I think that it should work. And I'd recommend it because I think this is wonderful. I talked about 
main actor default, that's a setting, and non-isolated, non-sending, also a setting. And there's just, there's so many of them. You know, I remember a time when I didn't even understand how to change a setting value in Swift. I just used the default and I never thought about it. Uh, and we, we do not live in that world anymore. Not only do you have to carefully control the settings you use to get the behaviors you want, you also need to be aware of what the settings are for all code that you are reading, no matter where you find it. Uh, now, with all this possibility here, you might be wondering, what should you do? What are the best settings? And when I was, I was making this slide, I was trying to decide, what word should I emphasize here? I mean, maybe it's the, is it the, I'm not sure, is it the do? And as soon as I saw that, I thought, no, I don't like telling people what to do. So instead, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. Uh, approachable concurrency. You know, there's actually a setting in Xcode called approachable concurrency. But all that is, is a group of compiler flags. Turn them all on or off at once. Uh, and I plan on turning them all on, because most of them aren't going to have a major impact on your code, except for that whole non-isolated, non-sending by default. It requires a migration, and I think it's worth it. How about complete checking? Concurrency is implemented using the type system. When you have checking turned off, you have turned off part of the type system. And there was a time when I felt pretty strongly that if you're using concurrency, you need to have that compiler feedback. However, I got to say that non-isolated, non-sending by default has gone a remarkably long way towards mitigating some of the problems that people can get themselves into. So I still think it's a good idea. I'm just not certain that it is as critical as it once was. How about, uh, how about going to six mode? You can turn on pretty much every feature that comes with the Swift 6 language mode and remain in Swift 5. So the reason you do this is just because you really want to be very strict about preventing data races. And maybe you do. This is a decision for you and your team, but I don't think there's a tremendous amount of pressure to do this. Remember, the Swift 6.2 compiler supports the Swift 4 language mode, which is either 7, maybe even 8 years old at this point. So there's really no rush here. Uh, it's surprising how effective just waiting has been. I don't even want to think about how much extra complexity I have added to 510 projects that with Swift 6.2 is just not necessary anymore. Uh, I will say, though, that I anticipate changes to the language in this area slowing down. So Waiting may not be the same. However, you know, there's still lots of APIs that have to be updated, especially now with sendable meta type. So it may still pay off to just delay this a little bit longer. How about setting main actor by default? I know many people are doing it, and they're doing it with success. I am finding it personally difficult to constantly switch back and forth mentally between knowing that code is implicitly non-isolated or main actor. So I'm currently going to hold off on this. Um, you should feel good. If you see a lot of main actors and you want to get rid of them, go for it. Uh, if your goal is to, is to delay exposure to concurrency, I think what you might find is that works, but it only works a little. And you're going to instead be exposed to different kinds of problems that maybe our community doesn't yet have a good handle on great ways to, to deal with. But this is like the theme. This is the theme that I have been talking about throughout this, this ending here, is that you should be feeling good about taking your time. There's no rush. If, however, you're taking your time, I don't want you to be, be wasting your time. So if you're feeling frustrated or maybe confused, then come find me here. I would love to help you. That is, that is what I do. Thank you very much. <laughs>